Hello and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for joining with my wife and I as we record this sermon message for you today that we want to share with you. The title of today's sermon message is Palm Sunday and Jesus, our King of Kings. There would be no Palm Sunday without Jesus. What was Jesus saying to those who were celebrating his entrance into Jerusalem for the last time until the glorious return that is still yet to happen? He was entering the last time, though, in his physical ministry to keep the Passover with his disciples. So Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead, and the news had spread like wildfire. So before we go into the scriptures for today's message, let us uh, pray together. Please join with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending Jesus to show us your love. And as he showed us your love, that he would place himself on a cross, shed his blood to forgive our sins, take stripes on his body to heal us of our diseases. Then the resurrection from the dead would occur and we would be able to receive his spirit in us through the Holy Spirit. We realize, dear God, there's a work and a ministry still going today to bring to that reality of that Jesus is truly our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we are now the ambassadors of his kingdom on earth, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of light. And we ask and pray your blessing now to be upon this service and upon this message. And we do thank you in Jesus' most holy name. And together we say, Amen. Well, the first scripture we want to look at today is found in John 11, the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 45. This was after Lazarus had been raised from the dead. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. In other words, he raised Lazarus from the dead. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them that what Jesus had done. So they were informants. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they ask? Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take weigh both our temple and our nation. So they were looking at this totally from physical perspectives. Verse 49, and one of them named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up, you know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. And so he was offering up Jesus to die for the nation, which actually was true. He didn't realize in what way though. Verse 51, he did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, which again he did, and he also died for the entire world. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. Well, that's exactly true too, except now the whole world's included in that. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. So they're going to take things into their own hands, sort of like in today's politics. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. So you see, always the good guys being arrested is what we find out about political shenanigans. And so Jesus was not going to disappoint them. He definitely would appear before them. <clears throat> So now let's look at John, the 12th chapter, verse 9. 
Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. See, that caused the greatest stir, and it was right before him coming into Jerusalem for the last time, before Passover. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, as collateral damage. They had to take away the testimony of the one who had been raised from the dead. So we all have to be concerned about that. It's wonderful to be, to be a part of God's miracles, but then again, we also have to give account for the testimony we give. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Oh, testimonies are very powerful. And we need them for the kingdom of heaven's sake. So we realize, you know, it goes on. Prophecies being fulfilled. Prophecies still being fulfilled. We live in perilous times. That is prophetic from Matthew 24. We realize that the world will continue this way until Jesus comes in return as he was promised he will. And he will return in a glorious manner with all power and majesty so that the whole world will know that he has returned. So the Spirit of God was working in the people. So when Jesus came into Jerusalem, the people were being moved by the Spirit of God. And they were understanding who Jesus was. That's why they said, Hallelujah, King, King of the Jews. He is the King of the Kings, though, and King of the Lords. He's King of Kings of all time. So, but they were inspired to do that because over in Zechariah, the ninth chapter and verse 9, it says that is a prophecy. Zechariah 9 and verse 9. <coughs> it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And that's what happened on that particular Palm Sunday. <clears throat> Exactly that way, his disciples went and found this foal that had been prepared for them to use for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem on that day. And so then we have him coming into Jerusalem, and there's quite a big celebration that goes on. So we want to go now to John the 12th chapter beginning in verse 12. John 12 and verse 12. The next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. They were all excited. God's Spirit was moving them. <clears throat> to be excited, to give the proper attention to Jesus coming into Jerusalem as the King. Blessed is the King of Israel, they shouted. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your King is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all of this, only after Jesus was glorified. <clears throat> So you see, that's the way it happens often. With anything prophetic, we'll go through the prophetic part of it and then realize, well, what just happened there? We're not the ones who are perceptive. God is perceptive. God will reveal these things when he says, you need to know. And so they knew, finally, what had just happened. They realized that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Amen. Well, it's all been done for us. We are all the recipients of God's love for us. Our Father sent Jesus to show us his love, and did he ever show it? And this is just the beginning of many events over the course of this week coming up. <clears throat> so the scribes and the Pharisees did not want to recognize what the people were saying. You know, they're celebrating. Celebrate, 
Hallelujah. The king and Hosanna, Hosanna. They didn't want to recognize that as being true. So Jesus told them if the people did not say that it was true, the rocks would cry out that he was the king of kings. Let's notice that over in Luke, the 19th chapter. Luke 19 and verse 37. Luke 19 and verse 37. So when he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. See, Lazarus being the latest miracle. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. See, so we have people who are in political office today who say, come on, be quiet, you Christians. Don't say anything. You're causing a, a commotion here. Well, we just cannot do that. We, are, we cannot be restrained from testifying the good things of God. And Jesus told them, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And you know the stones that we're going to cry out? The temple in Jerusalem and all their fantastic stones they had to make that temple, they cried out when Rome sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD and they all came down. God was no longer in that place. So, that's what happened. The people didn't want to, and authority that is, didn't want to celebrate Jesus, but God did. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept. He loved Jerusalem. He's going to come back to Jerusalem. He wept and said, If you, even you, had known only on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. We have to recognize the time of God's coming to us. We have got to open our eyes and see God in our world and what He has done for us already in Jesus coming to us, giving His life to save us, to redeem us, to restore us, and to reconcile us to our Father. We have a great responsibility and we need to be busy as Jesus was busy fulfilling his Father's work on earth. He's not returned in glory, yet there's still a work of ministry to do. So let's notice what Jesus did in this wonderfully placed scripture in Philippians, the second chapter. Having the mind of Christ... Philippians 2 and verse 5. This sums up what Jesus was doing coming into Jerusalem, taking Passover, going to the cross, being raised from the dead. All coming up this next week. Verse 5, Philippians 2 verse 5, In your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Can you imagine not using it to your own advantage? Rather, he made himself nothing, literally. He became a sperm cell going into the womb of Mary. Can you even think of it? The God of all the creation of heaven and earth. It's just mind-boggling. But taking the very nature of a servant, a minister in other words, 
being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. See, he came in on the back of a colt, which was a young foal. He barely could carry his weight, probably. By becoming obedient to death. He knew what he was coming in to Jerusalem for. It'd be his final entrance. He wouldn't come out of there alive until the resurrection. His resurrection from three days in the tomb. Obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That's why he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords at the right hand of the Father today. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. So they shouted out, Hosanna! in his day and put palm fronds down for him to walk on and his colt to walk on. But he's looking for the time when every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So it's not over yet. It's not over yet, see. Now Jesus is asking us to join with him in his ministry of reconciliation today. And that's very important for us to recognize today. So we see what is necessary for humans to praise Jesus as our King of Kings. The sacrifice of Jesus and his resurrection from the dead. Even his disciples had a problem with the way this played out in real time. You'd think after coming into Jerusalem with such fanfare that that would carry all the way through the week. <laughs> but it didn't. Passover happened. Jesus washed their feet. He said, I am giving you a new way to do Passover. You see, this bread and this wine is my body and my blood. No longer is the body and blood of a sheep or goat. It was the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus. And he was then going to be taken after praying with his disciples. And he was going to be beaten and scourged almost to death before they had him tote his cross up the hill. And he had to have help with that, obviously. And then he died right there. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And then he said, it is finished. But it was only finished in the physical. His physical body was placed in the grave with a stone in front of it. And that stone spoke out too. And it said, hallelujah, the Lord is risen. And the angels came and rolled that stone back. And here Jesus came out full of glory. And everybody was sad and scared the only one who didn't run away and leave him was John because he promised to be there for Jesus' mother Mary. Everybody else said, oh, it's all over now. There's no hope. What are we going to do? Jews are wanting to kill us now for being disciples of Jesus. And he had to come to them and say, here I am. I want you to go now in my name and I want you to tell everybody what you know. Like us today, we need to tell people what we know. What do we know? Why is He our Savior? Does that mean anything to us today? It should. What is His ministry? He reconciled us to our Father through His death and resurrection. That's why our Father sent Him to us. And we see that over in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Let's look at it again. I repeat this often because it just seems like we don't understand it. And it's so plain. It's so plain. The devil has, in my estimation, blinded our eyes to these verses in here between verse 16 and verse 21. Verse 16 is used often, verse 21 is used often, and the verses in between are not. So we need to ask ourselves, why? Why don't we pay attention to those verses? 
between those two wonderful verses we use constantly. Well, as verse 14 and 15 say, he died for us, he rose for us, and now we're a new creation in him. Now we are a new creation in him. In verse 16, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. And we've got to do it that way. The political strife we have right now, we can't approach it like the world does. We have to approach it like Jesus does, who lives in us. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. We've got to stop that physical part of thinking and think spiritually. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has come, gone, the new is here, and all this is from God. See, in verse 18, we have this is all from God our Father. Remember, our Father sent Jesus to us. This is all from our Father, who reconciled us to himself. That's why he sent Jesus to us to die for us and be raised from the dead for us. He's reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us then the ministry of reconciliation. So how's the ministry of reconciliation going for you? Are you doing anything about that? Do you even use the term reconciliation? You see, the world has taken it like they've taken the word love. They've taken the word reconciliation and they have destroyed it into nothing. The devil doesn't want us to know about God's love or God's reconciliation in Christ. So he just destroys the name and the meaning of it, besmirches it, makes it worth nothing. But it's everything because we're supposed to be doing that ministry with Jesus. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. So that is required for reconciliation to occur. And he's committed to us, therefore, his children, his disciples, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors of his kingdom of light. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf. What? What are we being implored to say? Be reconciled to God. Well, we need to say it. So Jesus is going to be inspiring us to say it. The Holy Spirit is going to be inspiring us to say that. More now than ever before. We need to be obedient to the Scripture. This is our commission now. The whole body of Christ needs to get with it and do what Paul said we ought to be doing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We need to be the father of our children. We need to be the ones who make a difference in the world. So, we should be praising the holy name of Jesus our Lord and King as his ministers of his reconciliation and the ambassadors of his kingdom of light today. Please join with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. As we appreciate and celebrate this day of Palm Sunday, we recognize, dear God, that this is not where the story ends. It's a time of celebration and of good news, but we don't use this to rocket us into the real reason that Jesus died and rose from the dead, that we were reconciled to our Father, and therefore we are now to be a part of his, Jesus' ministry of reconciliation to prepare the way for your second coming into Jerusalem. We need you, dear God. We cannot do this on our own. We need the Holy Spirit's inspiration. We need your guidance and direction and strength and provision, dear God. Thank you. Please protect us from Satan and his demons and from the ways of Satan's world who want to kill us to get our testimony out of the way. But help us to stand strong and to be strong in you, Jesus. We thank you and ask your blessing, inspiration, and direction in Jesus' holy 
and righteous name we pray. And all together we say, Amen.